Welcome to our industry panel. Uh, my name is Casey Babcock and I'm a product marketing manager at Bitwarden. And I'm really excited to be joined today by Bob Van Loyt um, and Taime Gummers. Um, really excited to have you two here. Um, Bob is the CEO of Semi Technologies, the company behind the open source vector search engine, Weaviate. Um, he's offered, authored multiple articles um, um, and spoken at a TEDx event on technology and open source software topics. Uh, Taime works at the Northwave Red Team where he performs realistic simulations of cyber threat actors to prepare organizations for potential security breaches. Um, in his free time, Taime enjoys developing security software, um, including Ravio, Ravo OTP um, for managing one-time passwords. Uh, welcome, Bob and Taime. Really excited to have you here. Thanks for Thank having you. me. Great. So I'm just going to kick it off with a couple questions. Um, you can bounce it back and forth wherever you see fit. Um, but starting right off, both of you offer um, software solutions that are based on the open source software model. Um, Ravo, OTP, and Weav8. Um, could you maybe tell us a little bit more about those solutions and why you chose the open source software model? Yeah, you go first. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, sure. Um, so, yeah, I'll tell a little bit about Rivo and what Rivo could do. Um, Rivo OTP is basically an iOS application that allows you to um, secure your online identity. Um, basically, adds a layer of uh, uh, protection to your online accounts called a one time password, which I'm sure uh, everyone is familiar with uh, here. Um, and although I don't believe that OTP, um, is the holy grail to uh, screwing your online identity. I do believe that Rivo OTP uh, contributes to uh, the transition to a passwordless future, which I really believe in, uh, which is why, uh, why I built Rivo OTP. Um, why open source? Uh, um, well, I thought to myself, why, why not open source my product? Um, uh, I make Rivo uh, because I like to, not because it's my profession. Uh, so uh, I thought to myself, why not share that fun with everyone? Um, and I think open sourcing my product also helped me to improve my um, uh, code base and, and quality uh, because everyone should be able to read my code and understand it. Um, and by doing so, I think people also gain a better understanding of uh, the work involved into the development of, uh, of Rivo. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I'll hand it off to you, Bob. Yeah, so so a little bit of context. So we create database technology. So Weave 8 is a is a vector search engine. Um, so basically, it stores uh, representations coming from machine learning models that you can use for a variety of use cases, including uh, 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 cybersecurity, of course. Um, the thing is that if you build a database, and especially if it's like a new type of database, like Weave 8 is, then you somehow need to know how people like to use the database and what they expect from the database. Because a, uh, a database is like a core piece of um, uh, 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 technology. The, um, uh, uh, the, the problem that you have in the beginning is that you want to know from people, like, how do they use it? What do they like on, in the technology? How do they use it in production? What maybe was like a limiting factor for them to go to production? All these kind of things you want to learn. And building a community around your uh, uh, product is a very, very, very powerful tool to achieve that. So now the thing that you want to do is like you want to lower the barrier to build a community. And so an ideal way of doing that is doing it open source. And then there comes a lot of stuff with that. So for example, the transparency of the technology and those kind of things. But uh, most importantly, it is like to build a community to learn how they use the technology and how you need to improve the technology. They, sometimes they can also contribute to those kind of things. Depends a little bit on what you're building. But it's like a the thing you do to position yourself in the market and learn from people like how they want to use the technologies. That's why we've chosen the open source model. Absolutely. Yeah. Open, um, 
community um, feedback and community involvement is a big part of open source software. So I'm glad that we agree there. Um, Time, I have an additional question in terms of um, your solution because it's also in the cybersecurity space. So I was um, curious if you think the open source model for Revo OTP actually makes it more secure. And um, from your perspective, what are the benefits of using open source uh, an open source model for um, cybersecurity? Uh, interesting question. Um, I, I personally think that security, security and, and open sourcing a product or closed sourcing it um, is not directly related. Um, but I do think that um, open source products have a potential of being more secure than closed source competitors. Um, closed source competitors, of course, have the advantage of uh, security by obscurity. Uh, but I think that open source um, has the advantage of security researchers more easily being able to review your code, for example. Uh, now, this is not something that doesn't happen often with Rival OTP because Rival OTP has a really small community around it. Um, I rarely get the uh, 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 security uh, um, uh, vulnerability reports, for example. But I can imagine that if you have a bigger open source product like, like Bitwarden, for example, um, it can really help improve the security of the product. Um, but yeah, to conclude, uh, I think uh, security of the product uh, depends on many more factors than, uh, than if a product is open source or not. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And thank you for that little wrap up there. Um, I'm going to actually uh, direct the next question to Bob. Um, so you're the author of an article in Forbes titled um, Why the Business Model of Open Source Software Works, where you compare open source software to a restaurant that publishes its um, recipes and cookbooks. Um, I was wondering if you could expand on that and maybe kind of dive a little bit more into that analogy. Yeah, so so um, uh, something that often happens if you if you share with people that you that you're working on open source technology, uh, and especially people who are not like in the same industry, so in the industry of building open source technology, that you know they're sometimes confused about you know what you're trying to do. It's like why why would you give that away? Isn't that like the the secret sauce and and what you're giving away? And the thing is with, so I tried to come up with an analogy um, where I was like, well, actually this happens like around us all the time, open sourcing stuff. It's just in software, we specifically talk about it because <clears throat> in software, of course, we use language, in this case, programming language to write something down. And rather than keep it for ourselves, you know, we just, we just open that up. Um, it has to do with patents and those kind of things, right? So it's like a different structure. And the example that I use to describe something where a lot of value sits in the thing that is publicly available is like a high quality restaurant. And in the um, in the article, I, I take uh, I've, I, I took Momofuku as an as an example. That was just because when I when it popped into my mind, I was in New York and I was passing a Momofuku restaurant. So I was like, okay, then that's gonna be the example. But the idea is like if you create high quality. Um, uh, 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 food in this case or software so that's the analogy but if you create high quality food and you make that available to people to see like in an open kitchen and those kind of things how it's created and people enjoy eating the food so that's like your community of no not users but like uh, foodies I guess um, then you can start to monetize around that so that can be like well of course the restaurants itself but the where the people eat but also the um, you can make a cookbook, you know, recipes. You can share the recipes and you can sell those cookbooks. And you can say, okay, well, actually, the recipes that are in the cookbook, you can buy them as well. And then you get this whole chain of things in the vicinity around your technology that you um, uh, that you that you can can monetize. And now a question that you could could ask, like, well, if you do that, what, why does then the food need to be? You know, so in this case, the food or the software, why do, does it need to be open? And this is where I actually disagree a little bit with what Timer just said, like about the um, uh, that closed source uh, software is the same as open source. I don't think that's the case as all, at all. So that's like if you look at, at Conway's law, that basically states that the communication lines end up in the design of the software. If your communication line includes the community or in the case of the restaurant, the, the people who eat there, the foodies, right? then the food that you make or the software that you make changes based on the feedback that you're getting from that community. So um, long story short, 
I'm making an article in DT analogy with um, uh, with a restaurant because if you look at a restaurant, but you could also do, take like look at authors and books and those kind of things, where the analogy is like or bands in music, right? So where a band might make their music available for free online, but they give concerts, they sell books and those kind of things, and that is the exact same um, uh, uh, method where you make the core value publicly available and you capture value in the vicinity around that core value. Yeah, thank you for that explanation. That's great. And I think that really ties back to the idea of building a community around an open source solution, um, kind of seeing them, letting them see how everything gets made um, and how that kind of contributes to um, better adoption. So thank you for that. Um, uh, I'm going to hand it off uh, again to Taime. Um, so you've described Revo OTP as a one-time password manager that was created to solve some of the frustrations you personally experienced in the space. Um, could you maybe expand on some of those frustrations um, and exactly how your solution solves them? Yeah, definitely. Um, I started using uh, uh, Authenticator apps uh, well, many years ago, I'm not even sure how many years ago, uh, and there were only two apps available by then. Uh, that was the uh, the Microsoft Authenticator and the Google Authenticator, uh, and and safe to say they were terrible. Uh, they were very user unfriendly. Um, I had a list of of sixty uh, one time passwords in my uh, Google Authenticator, um, and for example, the Google Authenticator didn't let me uh, search through these passwords, so I had to scroll through the list manually every time I wanted to log in, uh, which I hated, uh, and which is one of the reasons why I started developing uh, Rivo. Uh, so I fixed it by just uh, adding a, a search functionality uh, right under my, uh, my thumb, uh, which allows me to search through all my, uh, my OTPs. Uh, but that's just one thing. Um, another thing that I really hated was that I actually had to retype the tokens, the six digits. Um, I'm a lazy programmer. And I would like to um, have that automatically appear on my screen once I log in. Um, so I fixed that as well uh, in Rivo. Uh, so I built a uh, macOS companion app. Uh, so now whenever I tap on an OTP in my iOS app, uh, it automatically uh, sends it to my macOS host. And um, I don't have to retype them anymore. Um, and I think one of the most important uh, things that I implemented, and it was a, a real frustration for me, uh, was that I didn't really feel like I owed my data in, uh, in the Google Authenticator, but also in the Microsoft Authenticator app. Um, so for example, um, it frustrated me that uh, I couldn't sync my OTPs to other apps uh, or to other mobile phones, for example, that I had, or to my iPad, or uh, I don't know, my, my MacBook maybe. Um, what, what, what also worried me was that I didn't feel like um, uh, whenever I would lose my iPhone or I would lose my um, uh, uh, phone that the, the authenticator was installed on, that I would be able to use a backup and get back online. I was afraid that I would be locked out of all my accounts. Um, and there wasn't really an export functionality to make a local backup, for example, uh, using these apps. Uh, so I fixed that in Rivo as well. I implemented uh, a synchronization feature that syncs it to all the devices that uh, Rivo is installed on. Um, and I allow people to export their OTPs uh, using an encrypted archive. Uh, so they really own their data and they can move to any authenticator that they want to, uh, uh, if they start to dislike uh, Rivo, which I hope uh, they don't. That's great. Yeah, I think that's a really common frustration with people using um, two-factor authentication kind of applications like that is accidentally losing the device that it's located on. Um, I think we've all kind of experienced that firsthand, unfortunately. Um, so this next question is for both of you. Um, so as founders of open source solutions, um, I'm curious what your thoughts are on the future of the open source software industry. Um, will this kind of model continue to evolve? Do you think more solutions will adopt open source models? Do you think less solutions will adopt open source models? Um, and just kind of what do you think that it will look like. I'm curious to hear your predictions. Um, so that's <laughs> that's actually that's a that's a complex question. I think let, let me take an, let let me take a, a very specific angle to this. So like a, a different angle that you that, that you know that you might be looking for. And that is, I 
you know, I need to run a company. So we're now like with 30 people working on open source technology and having, uh, building a community, communicating with the community, the way that you structure the software, this open, it has like, it's, it's an open way of working together. So that attracts people to the company who like to work in that fashion. So I noticed that open source that not, does not only have like a, um, an impact on the community that we're building and the business that we're building, but also the company that we're building. And um, having this open way of, of working is, we even see that in like people working in, on, on HR, culture, design, those kind of things. They start to copy these methods as well. We are even open source uh, um, in our company, not only the software, but also how we work. So you can see how we work is open sourced on our, and there, of course, we were inspired by, by GitLab. And um, so the way that people like to work, who knows, maybe in like this this post, hopefully knock on wood, post COVID world, right, where like there's more remote work, where, where you know, uh, where you can find talent all over the world. Open source enables you to work in a specific way with people, but it also creates a, it, it's ingrained in your company culture. And um, uh, people or customers, you know, deciding to work with certain tools or solutions might like that culture that they see in the company behind the open source project. So um, I, I, I would not be surprised if more companies um, want to build a culture that is like based on the open source nature of the, of their company. So mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll, I'll make that my answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, and uh, time, I, we're running up a little bit against time. So maybe could you tell us uh, your answer in um, a couple sentences, just wrapping sure. up today's session. Um, well, first of all, I fully agree with, uh, with Bob. Um, from a technical perspective, uh, I would like to add that I think that um, a lot of organizations aren't really uh, aware yet that they actually use a lot of open source products mm. uh, in their commercial solutions. Um, and I think that once they start to realize that, um, I think that can really help um, grow open source companies and, and products. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much to both of you for joining. This has been an amazing panel um, and it's been great speaking with you today. You're thank welcome. you so much. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thanks thank for having you. me. Bye-bye. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>